Will Christ be looking for you at his return? It's an interesting question to ponder. Of course, we want Christ to look for us in a good way when he returns, but how is it that we are going to get his attention? What is it that he has already described in his word that he is going to look for at his return? So who will Christ be looking for at his return? Today, I'd like to go over seven points, seven things that Christ will be looking for when he comes. And if we are fulfilling these characteristics, if we are living the type of life, then Christ will indeed recognize us. Point number one, he's going to be looking for Philadelphians. In Revelation 3, verse 8, and we'll go through a few of these verses here. But of course, chapter 3 is, along with chapter 2, are the letters to the churches, these different eras that will exist throughout time of what the church will go through. <clears throat> and of course, the Philadelphian era, the second to last era, is one that there's nothing uh, bad said about it. And so when we look at this, we can take a lot from it. We can look at it and say, okay, what is it then that I need to be doing to be a Philadelphian. And he describes them here, beginning in verse 8. Well, <clears throat> he goes, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength. So they were not this incredibly large organization that was going out and doing this super mighty work, but they had a small work that they're able to do. And it says, they have kept my word and not denied my name. So they have not denied the name of Christ in, in word or deed, and they have kept his word. This is an identifying characteristics. And he says, again, the way he begins it is, I know your works. <clears throat> and so, again, we see that they have works, and that they're keeping his word. And then skipping down to verse 10, he says, because you have kept my command to persevere. So not only are they doing these things, but they continue to do these things, not only in the good times, but in the bad times, when things are, are going away from what is nice and what is comfortable, they continue to do it no matter what is going on around them. And because of that, he says, I'll keep you from the hour of trial that's going to come on the whole world. So again, a promise to have to not go through the great tribulation. Now, <clears throat> let's notice in Matthew 24, just keep your, your finger here for a second, what it means is my command to persevere. In Matthew 24 and verse 13, Matthew 24 and verse 13, again, the Olivet Prophecy that we've been talking about uh, in recent sermons. It says, But he who endures to the end shall be saved. So again, there's this necessity to continue all the way to the very end. You cannot pull up short if there is this expectation of salvation. He says, Okay, I gave you this command. You have to persevere all the way to the end. And that means that there's going to be some things that we have to go through as a Philadelphian, even. And if you look back up to verses 10 through 12, it says that they're going to be offended, betray one another, hate one another. There are going to be many false prophets that are going to come up and deceive many. And there's going to be lawlessness that's going to abound, and the love of many will grow cold. So these are the things that are going to have to be endured. This hatred, this offense, this betrayal, deception, lawlessness, lovelessness. We're going to have to undergo these trials, and we're going to have to continue to have the fortitude to persevere through all of this. These are things that we need to be prepared to go through. Back to Revelation 3. <clears throat> Revelation 3, verses 11 and 12. It says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Of course, this is Christ speaking. 
He says, hold fast what you have that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, and then he goes on to list what's going to be the reward of those who overcome. But there's this, again, necessity to hold fast and how important that is today. That once you have the truth, that you hold on to the truth, that you don't deviate from the truth, that you don't let your own ego and pride get in the way, that you don't be dissuaded by uh, anyone who comes by with the latest wind of doctrine. You have to hold fast to the truth. Or, as it says here, you're in jeopardy of losing your crown. And as we go through this, we need to continue to overcome. Of course, that's overcoming ourselves and Satan and society as we grow in character. This is a Philadelphian. This is what it means to be a Philadelphian and what Christ is going to look for at his return. Let's just continue over to Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10 verses 32 to 39. Again, kind of echoes what we're talking about here. Hebrews 10 verses 32 to 39. <clears throat> Hebrews 10, verse 32. But recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings. So again, once you receive the truth, again, this is not going to protect you from trials and tribulations. No, just the opposite. It means that God's going to be in your life with trials and tribulations to bring about a character and an image more like His. So partly while, verse 33, you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated, for you had compassion on me and my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. So again, the <clears throat> these things, they came upon them, they willingly gave of their goods, and this is what the Christian does. This is what the person does as he builds character and grows in uh, in the Word of God and, and also in the faith. Verse 35, Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. So again, <clears throat> He's reiterating some of the stuff we were just reading here that, again, we need to have this continuing faith that there will be this reward that comes at the very end. But we must continue all the way to that point that we have this need of endurance and so that we continue to do what? The will of God. Live by His Word. Continue to overcome. He says, for yet a little while, he who is coming will come and will not tarry. So I know that it seems like a long time and that we have to endure day after day, week after week, month after month, and year after year. But yet, in the scheme of things, it is but a short time. And he says, during this relatively short time, we must keep on keeping on. And he says, verse 38, now... The just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. So we need to continue to move forward in faith. In fact, this is point number two. In terms of what Christ is going to look for when he returns. He's going to look for those who have faith. But notice this unbelievable and very telling statement that it makes in Luke 18 and verse 8. It's a single scripture. I can read it for you. In Luke 18 and verse 8, he says, and this is Christ speaking, he says, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? So this is one of the things that Christ is going to be looking for when he's looking for us. 
And so presumably those who are listening want to be in God's good graces, that we want to be the ones that he is looking for. And so it's going to become incumbent upon us to demonstrate that we have faith. Now, <clears throat> so, you know, it's, it's still it's, it's unbelievable to me that we, we think of ourselves as having faith, yet Christ says at this point in time that, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to find faith, true faith, the amount of faith that he is looking for. You know, so when he returns, is he going to look at us and see a faithful people? Okay, so what, what is faith? faith? Faith is, I guess, most simply belief, is to believe in God. But that's only a small aspect of it. More importantly, it is to believe God. It's to have this trust and this confidence that we were talking about in Hebrews, that we're to, that we do what he asks us to do, and also the faith that he's going to do what he says he's going to do. It is the faith of Jesus. This is what this this is why this distinction is so important. This faith in Jesus or the faith of Jesus. Okay, we we have again and again a small part of it is faith in Jesus and, and what he did. But the more important and larger portion is the faith of Jesus. What faith did Jesus have, especially here when he was on earth? He was with the Father for eternity. They were putting this plan together that they're going to execute. The Father and the Son were together, and the Son had full assurance that everything that they said that they were going to do was going to happen. The whole plan, as they laid it out before they even created the, the earth and the universe, that when these things would happen, when Christ was on earth, he was going to walk in faith knowing fully how everything was going to turn out. I mean, that is faith. That is the faith of Jesus. He had no doubt. He had no fear about the things that God said would happen and how they would go, come about. How would you like to have that faith? This is exactly the type of faith that we're talking about, the faith of Christ. So if we have that faith, okay, this, this assurance that we're going to possess what we hope for, it, it's, even, it, it's even so strong as it's evidence that we have what we are looking forward to before we even see it. So this faith actually precedes this. So when Christ returns, how recognizable do you think something like that would be? Right. <clears throat> well, it's not even just the fact that it's something that's completely internalized. There's a test for it. The evidence of our faith is in our actions. Our works demonstrate our faith. So it's not this dead faith. It's not this faith that we get, quote-unquote, imbued with, and then that's it. No, it's more to it than that. In fact, let's look over at James 2. Just go down through some verses in James 2, beginning in verse 14. Again, just to reiterate what James is saying here and what we also we need to understand that belief alone is not enough. It requires action. Otherwise, it's dormant and lifeless. James 2 and verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? And of course the answer is no, not in that way. So again, he says from the very beginning, you know, he's making the point, can we actually have faith without works? Many would say, yes, many, this is a foreign concept, an idea. But verse 17, he says, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. It is a dead 
faith, a faith that really does not exist and is not recognizable in terms of the return of Christ. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And then verse 19 I had to throw in. It's one of my favorite scriptures. It says, you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, how well does that make the point that demons who have no part in the plan of God are in the future, who have no faith, who have gone off in the wrong direction, they believe that there is a God. They know that there is a God. They believe that there is one God. But what does that, what does that belief, what does that faith that there is God, what, what good does that do them? None. Verse 22, do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. Verse 24, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone or faith only. Verse 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead. So when Christ returns, or right before he returns, things are going to get very bad. You know, many are going to, quote unquote, believe in God. You know, the, the old saying about there's no atheist in the foxhole is bombs are going off all around uh, all around them and this you know say military military personnel or say uh, more pertinently <clears throat> it's people who are in their homes and they're invading armies and threat of this that and the other thing are they going to turn to God are they going to believe in God well I think a lot may but again th this faith in God is very short-term, short-lived, and in many cases, as the Bible reveals, that some of these things are going to happen in terms of the day of the Lord, and people still won't repent. And so then God's going to come you know, finally again with the seven last plagues, and because, again, they be, have become recalcitrant. So e even the fact that things get bad doesn't mean, necessarily mean that people are going to start to believe in God, but... Even if they do, a lot of it can be short-lived. A lot of it is a worldly type of sorrow. And at the very end of the day, it's going to be too little and too late because it's not just this wanting and crying out to God and belief that there's a God. It requires a living faith. This is what Christ is returning to, one that can be demonstrated. It's a dynamic, not a static Faith. We don't get it one time, and then that's it. We are to grow in it. It's a living faith. It has the ability to grow and to be recognizable. And when Christ returns, this is what he has to see. So our faith is going to continue. The faith that we have now has got to continue to become stronger as we diligently seek him and live more by his ways. It is this living faith. Point number three, as we segue from, again, one point to the other, and there's always going to be overlap because the Bible fits together perfectly. But point number three is, will he find us so doing? Let's turn over to Matthew 24, verses 44 through 47. Matthew 24, verses 44 through 47. <clears throat> Therefore, this is Christ speaking, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is a faithful, okay, having faith, and wise servant, whom his master made ruler over his household, to give them food in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, 
will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all of his goods. So when Christ returns, he expects us to be so doing. Again, we were talking about this in, in the previous point in terms of, of faith. There's an expectation of doing works. Let's turn back to chapter 5, Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. Matthew 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, Christ speaking in the Beatitudes here, the Sermon on the Mount. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all those who are in the house. So why does he give us this analogy? He says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So is there, there is this expectation that once God begins working in us and we begin reflecting that light, that there are works that go along with it. There are good works, and the works reflect God. They glorify Him. The, the credit goes to Him because we are not that way in and of ourselves. And so, again, these things point to the fact that we are Christians, and it is the fact that we are doing good works, not dead works, not bad works, not carnal works, but we're doing good works. This is to what we were called. 2 Timothy 3, verses 14 through 17. This is, again, how we are being prepared, in a sense, by knowing what it is that God has revealed to us. 2 Timothy 3, Verses 14 through 17. 2 Timothy 3, verses 14 through 17. It says, But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. Again, knowing that it, it came from a true teacher and... Again, once you know these things, that's what we're talking about in terms of holding fast, then you are assured of them. You continue in them. Verse 15, And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So we see that it continues to all go together. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, it's God-breathed, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. So he says, okay, here's the Holy Scripture, all Scripture is given to you so that you can be complete, so that God can begin this work in you, and He can replace the carnality, the <clears throat> human nature that we have, with His whole, His divine nature, and that we may become more like His image and put that on, and put the mind of Christ. Why? so that we will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So there, it's incumbent upon us then to not just know the Word of God, but to do the Word of God. And so then through our works, we show that we have changed 
from the way that we used to be, that we have repented of our carnality. We, we show the love of God. We, we glorify him in this way. You know, like we were talking about in Matthew 5, that we now, because of the way we act, show God in us. We, we show this knowledge and understanding of God, and we set examples for others. We are doing these good works and not putting them under a basket. So as we do this, then we grow in the, in the Spirit. And eventually, you know, there, our reward is based on our works in terms of how much we do, how much we continue to grow. <clears throat> now, the other aspect here of, of that, and again, this, is, this goes back to the character aspect of it, and that is bearing fruit. Is he going to find us bearing fruit? John 15. John 15, verses 1 through 8. There's an expectation always of growth. John 15 and verse 1 says, I am the true vine, again, Christ speaking. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Again, these are the, the trials and tribulations that, again, God has orchestrated that we may put on his character, his express image. But the point here is that there is an expectation of bearing fruit. Okay? If there is not fruit being born, then it is taken away. Okay, The analogy holds that if, if the tree does not bear fruit, then what good is the tree or what good is the branch that is uh, producing or not producing? He says, you're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Again, there's <clears throat> this also expectation that we put on Christ, that he is in us, that we live by him, through him, through the power. And again, it's God in us as well, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he says that, again, if we're going to be a part of this vine, we can't separate ourselves from it. And you can't just take a branch, cut it off, and it's going to bear fruit by itself. No, we have to be a part of the true vine, which is the way that Christ began uh, this chapter. <clears throat> says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. So there's this expectation that we are to bear much fruit, but we have to use Christ in us to continue to do that. So again, it's this symbiotic relationship in this sense that we need Christ in us, and we need to be remain within this vine. And we need to use him in us to bear the fruit, but we have to bear the fruit. He says, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch, it is withered, and they gather them and throw them in the fire, and they're burnt. Again, this is an allusion to the, the lake of fire, that if Christ returns and we're not bearing fruit, then the result is going to be this branch that is, is worthless, right? And it's going to be tossed to the side into the fire. It says, if you abide in me, verse 7, my words abide in you. My words, again, abide in you. We, we see that there is this uh, continuity and, and this meshing of, of all these ideas that they can all continue to all work together. So in some sense, it's hard to separate these points. But you see how they all fit together. But again, we live by every word of God. And of course, you know, how many times have we talked about <clears throat> already keeping the word that, um, that was given to us in, in Revelation 3 and then in 2 Timothy, 
the, the word that's given to us and how it's profitable for these, these works and is also a necessity for us to bear fruit. So he continues, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. And by this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. So again, as we become more like God, all right, and bear fruit, as we do works that are befitting our calling, we glorify God. Again, the, everything points back to the fact that God has done these things in us and is doing these things for us, and we have to let him work in our lives, but we must work along with him. And he says, so by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. This is what he's looking for at his return. He's looking for his students, those who are glorifying the Father, in both fruit and in works. And if we want a quick list of the fruit, of some of the fruit, Galatians 5, verses 22 through 25, it, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Again, it's the fruit, not the fruits. The fruit of the Spirit. If you have God's Spirit, then you have the love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Okay, he says these are the things that he's going to look for as return. This fruit. And then he says those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Talking about the, the uh, in, in the previous verses there, what he calls the works of the flesh. The old man, the way we used to be. He says, verse 25, though, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So if we have God's Spirit in us, we will demonstrate these attributes, and Christ will recognize us at his return if he sees these things among the fruit that we're bearing, and if he also sees the works, the good works. Point number four. Ezekiel 9, verses 4 through 6. He's going to look for those who sigh and cry at his return. Ezekiel 9, verses 4 through 6. In Ezekiel 9, verse 4, it says, And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. So again, this is one of the things that Christ is at his return. He sends out one of the angels and he says, Put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry. The ones who look at what the world is doing and they are appalled by it about all the abominations. The abominations are, are simply anything that goes against the word of God. From the least to the greatest, it, it doesn't matter. These are all abominations. And there are a certain amount of people that are going to be sighing and crying over what is going on. The fact that mankind has turned away from God, that they're not seeking Him, and because of the repercussions of these things. They, there's man's way or Satan's way, and then there's God's way. Okay, God's way works. Man's way eventually is going to lead to death. So man has gone through, and it has become okay to live and do the things that they're doing. And, and some of them have no qualms about this. I mean, if, if you don't believe that, you know, go look at the story of, of Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. There, there were 
I mean, the condition of the whole city was such that they were doing such vile things that God just destroyed them all, except for Lot and his two daughters. These abominations continue on, and it's going to be a part of what's going on in the end time. And the question then remain, remains is that, do we go along with it? Do we not see it and understand it for what it is? Or do we see them for the atrocities that they are? And we pray and, <clears throat> and we sigh and we cry more earnestly that uh, God return, that these things can be over, that we can stop living this way of life and that we can bring on uh, Christ, the kingdom of God on earth, and all that that portends. So there's going to be not that many that are going to be doing this, but it is one of the things that, that God says, and it becomes a necessity as well when you understand, we read the next couple of verses, it says, to the others, he said in my hearing, go after him through the city and kill. So as he's going through, as one angel is going through and putting the marks on the forehead, another one's coming right behind him and he's killing without pity, without sparing his eye. Those who do not sigh and cry over the abominations and more than likely, they are the ones who are committing the abomination. So it's not just the fact that that you, you shouldn't be committing these things. You, you should have a perspective, and you should long for something different, and that you pray Christ return. And so, because he sends them out, verse 6 is utterly, he says, slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women, but do not come near anyone who upon, anyone on whom is the mark. And begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. So we see then that the ones who should know better and do know better but yet they are not living that way of life, that they are not the ones sighing and crying. They're, what, are they just going along to get along? Are, are they living this kind of lukewarm, lackluster, Laodicean type of life? Well, God makes it very clear that the ones who should know better, he says, that's where I'm going to start. And so just because, again, this is what we need to understand, just because we are of the sanctuary, just because we are in the church of God, just because we've been going to church for a long time, is it, you know, those things are not going to save you in the end. Okay, so it becomes, there's this necessity to not only long for what God has, but to eschew what it is that the world is doing. And if we do not have this mark, you know, again, God's not going to recognize us. And he's going to go through during the day of the Lord, and he's going to wipe out people left and right who are not living the type of life that he wants. Point number five, Christ is going to be looking for those who are watching for him. Revelation 16, 15 says, Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches. Blessed is he who watches. In Luke 21, 36, I think that's typically our go-to scripture when it comes to watching, it says, watch therefore, and this is Christ speaking, watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. So again, it's an admonition 
to us in terms of what is coming down the pipe that if there is this expectation to escape all these things and to continue to live and to be there and to stand before the Son of Man, okay, to, to be able to stand there and that he's so that he can see you and recognize you, we have to watch and pray. Now, the word here for watch typically has more of the connotation of staying awake. Of course, you can't watch unless you are awake. But it's to remain awake. Now, the, the disciples, before they had God's Holy Spirit, before they understood what was exactly happening, failed in this regard. In Matthew 26, verses 36 through 44, Again, Christ is trying to give them a message here, not one for just then, but for all time as well. And they failed. Matthew 26, verses 36 through 44. This is right before Christ's death. And he came to them to Gethsemane. And he says, sit here for a while, I go pray over there. Sit here while I go and pray over there. Verse 37, he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, be James and John, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. So again, Christ tells them, his condition, his state. And he says, you know, can you just stay here and stay awake with me? And he went a little further, fell on his face and prayed, saying, oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, this responsibility that he had taken upon himself. And nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Of course, it had to go on. It had to happen. Verse 40, then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Could you not just stay here with me and stay awake with the Son of Man? Verse 41, watch and pray, lest you enter into, into, into temptation. He knew that Satan seeked, or sought to sift him. <clears throat> and he knew that Peter had trials coming still ahead. And he knew that he needed that strength that would only come from being awake and praying. Of course, you can't pray unless you're awake. So he had to, but the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so as much as Peter and them may have wanted to do that, again, they didn't understand the situation fully, they didn't do it. And so again, a second time he went away and prayed, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And again, I don't, I don't blame them. They didn't know exactly what was going on. They, they couldn't understand. And so he left them and went away again a third time and prayed, saying the same words. But the point is here that they did not watch and pray, okay? They did not have that spirit, okay, that was sufficient to understand the necessity to stay awake, especially at that time. This, again, you can parallel to where we are right now, is that we need to continue to stay awake spiritually and to continue to pray so that we do not fall into temptation, so that we do not come up short, so that we are ready for the return of Christ who's going to come like a thief in the night. How is that 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 can be? We're all expecting the return of Christ, and yet he's still going to come as a thief. I dare say it's because we are not watching as we are to be watching for it. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 through 8. 
1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 through 8. It says, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. And when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are to be awake. You're to be watching. You are the sons of light and sons of the day. You're not of the night or darkness. Let us, therefore, let us not sleep as others do. Let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith Okay, the faith that Christ wonders if it's going to exist when he returns. And love as a helmet, and the hope of salvation. So we have then, again, Paul talking to the Thessalonians saying, you have to stay awake. You have no other choice. Okay, you know better. We have to be watching. We have to be sober. You know, we, it says watch and be sober. We're looking for the return of Christ. <clears throat> we cannot be asleep. If we're asleep, then these are, you know, how is Christ going to recognize us? Then if we're in bed, if we're not awake up, praying, and looking for his return. Romans 13, verses 11 through 14. He says, <clears throat> And do this knowing that the time, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. So again, we have to be awake. We have to be watching. We have to be praying. Okay? If we were ever slumbering, he says, we have to wake up now because salvation is nearer than when we first believed, when we first understood these things. It says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us cast off the works of darkness. Okay, so again, see how these things all fit together? Okay, we're doing the works of light, the works of God. Let us properly, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness, not in lust and strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the, the flesh to fulfill its lust. So, again, it, <clears throat> it says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. This word for put on in duo basically means to put on Christ as Christ clothing. And this transitions into our next point, is that we need to be properly attired. So Christ is going to look for someone that is properly attired, who is dressed appropriately. So it's interesting, of course, the, the theme of, the, of Revelation is the day of the Lord. So the interesting thing is that how much symbolism there is on how the spiritually faithful will be dressed. In Revelation 3 and 4, and we'll just point to a couple of these. Revelation verses, or chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, talking about Sardis and not defiling their garments, and they shall walk with me in white. For they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. So again, this, this symbol of, of purity. And he's, he's even saying that they have not defiled their garments. And then a few verses later in chapter, in the same chapter, chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, 
it's now saying the opposite to the Laodiceans. Says, he says, you say that you're rich and you're wealthy and you need nothing, but you don't know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Okay, so they were not obviously properly attired. They did not have the the white garments that they were supposed to be wearing. And so he continues in verse 18, he ca- I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. So this character that they're supposed to be developing, okay, the fruit that they're supposed to be bearing, that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. So they're supposed to, again, quote-unquote, buy these these garments that they be clothed because they were naked. Now let's understand what exactly this clothing is that we're putting on. Let's go over to verse, uh, chapter 19, verses 7 and 8. <clears throat> Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8. And it says, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So now we see how we're putting all these things together that <clears throat> God imbues us with righteousness Okay, we, we are not righteous in and of ourselves or by ourselves. But once he has done this, then it is incumbent upon us to begin to reflect that righteousness by our acts. And so what is missing then from the Laodiceans is that they did not have these righteous acts. Okay, they were not doing uh, the the works that they were supposed to be doing, and nor were they bearing the fruit that they were supposed to be bearing. And so it's come down to the very end, and it's as though they are naked. They have not put on Christ. In Colossians 3, in Colossians 3, verses... <clears throat> should, should read all the way down to verse 14... But I think for uh, lack of time, we will kind of uh, skip through it just a little bit. But you can put it through your notes. But it's interesting here. In fact, let's just... um, Well, we'll go through it quickly here. In Colossians 3, and beginning in verse 5, it says, again, by contrast, it says, Therefore put to death your members which are on earth, fornication, uncleanness, the ways that... We used to be. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. So if you're acting that way, the abominations that we're talking about, the the wrongful ways, the ways that don't follow God, then the wrath of God is coming upon them. And he says, we used to be that way. He says, but now he says, we put off these things in verse 8. In verse 9, do not lie to one another, having since you have put off the old man with his deeds. So this word is put off the old man. It says ek duo. Okay, so you've you've gotten rid of that type of clothing, those types of acts. It's taking away. And then verse 10, you have put on. Okay, this is in duo. Okay, this is what we were talking about at the end of the previous point, is that we're to put on Jesus Christ. Okay, again, that word's in duo, is to be clothed with in this way. And so here he is in verse 10, you have and have put on, okay, in duo, the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So again, the point is, is that we take off the old clothing, we put on this new clothing, which is the righteous acts, which is what is necessary when it comes to the return of Christ and what he is going to be expecting of us is to be putting on these white garments 
and he condemns those of the Laodiceans who are, are basically naked, who have not done what they are supposed to do. So we are to put on and to be clothed as Christ or with Christ, okay, his ways, okay, not our old ways. So again, you can go through and kind of read the rest of the chapter and put all that together. But we cannot have both ways, okay? We, we can't have the old garments and the new garments. They don't weave together. You don't do the, the raggedy, tagged type of garments that you have that's old and falling apart and has holes in it, okay? And is not the way that we should be dressed before God. But we're to, you, you can't put then the new with it and, and try to mesh these and try to keep the other without getting rid of it. No, they're incompatible, these old and new garments. We have one way that we need to be. And so we need to be properly attired by the fact that we act in the way that we are supposed to be acting. And so when Christ returns, he's going to be looking for people, not who are, have this old tattered garments, not ones who are naked, but the ones who have the white garments. In the end, Christ is going to be returning to a remnant, to a very small, specific group of people. In Isaiah 59, Isaiah 59, again, some familiar scriptures. We'll just kind of go through it rather quickly. But it begins by saying that the Lord's hand's not shortened, that he can't save, or his ear heavy, that it he cannot hear. But he's saying that our iniquities have separated us from him. And he goes on through the, uh, the chapter and talks about what's going to be going on, specifically at his return, how there's not going to be justice or truth. People are going to be speaking lies. They're going to conceive evil and bring forth works of iniquity and violence. They're going to shed innocent blood, and there's going to be wasting and destruction in their paths. They have not known the way of peace. They're lacking the light that we've talked about already. They're in darkness, and they walk in blackness, and they grope like they're blind. All right? Again, those were some of the actual other attributes of the, the Laodiceans, that they were blind. And it says, you know, because of these things, salvation is far from them. Okay? They, they transgress, they lie against God, they depart from God. Okay? There is no righteousness among them. It stands afar off, and truth is a casualty that has fallen in the street. In the street. And then... Verse 15, it says, So truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. So he looked upon all these things. And verse 16, he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. So point seven, he's looking for someone to stand in the gap. Someone to do the things that we've been talking about. This person who is going to be able to stand out among the things that are going on. Continuing verse 20, it says, The Redeemer will come to Zion, and to those who turn from transgression... In Jacob, says the Lord. This is what Christ wants to return to. He, he wants to return to someone who is willing to stand in this gap. Okay, by their actions to be this intercessor. One that is going to stand out. One that is going to be recognizable when he returns. So when Christ returns... Who is he going to be looking for? We have a very tall order before us of a lot that needs to be done if we expect 
at the return of Christ for Christ to recognize us. We have a lot of work that we're to be doing. We have a lot of character that we need to build. We have still works ahead of us and fruit that needs to be born. We need to be looking and watching and sighing and crying for what is to come, for what is already happening. The, I think, signs of the times show that we don't have an awful lot of time. So we need to be doing our Father's business. We need to be about doing what it is that God has said we should be doing. And even the things that we've gone over today has been just a superficial going over of the depth of the things that we need to make sure that we are doing now so that when Christ does return, he will recognize us.